Chapter Two, Part Two of the Water Babies by Charles Kingsley, read for LibriVox.org by Corey Samuel. The kind old dame came back at twelve when school was over to look at Tom, but there was no Tom there. She looked about for his footprints, but the ground was so hard that there was no slot, as they say in dear old North Devon. And if you grow up to be a brave, healthy man. You may some day know what no slot means, and know too, I hope, what a slot does mean, a broad slot, with blunt claws, which makes a man put out his cigar, and set his teeth, and tighten his girths when he sees it, and what his rights mean, if he has them, brow, bay, tray, and points, and see something worth seeing between Haddon Wood and Countisbury Cliff, with good Mr. Palk Collins, to show you the way and mend your bones as fast as you smash them. Only, when that jolly day comes, please don't break your neck. Stogged in a mire you will never be, I trust, for you are a heath-cropper, bred and born." So the old dame went in again, quite sulky, thinking that little Tom had tricked her with a false story, and shammed ill, and then run away again. But she altered her mind the next day for when Sir John and the rest of them had run themselves out of breath, and lost Tom, they went back again, looking very foolish, and they looked more foolish still when Sir John heard more of the story from the nurse, and more foolish still again when they heard the whole story from Miss Ellie, the little lady in white. All she had seen was a poor little black chimney-sweep, crying and sobbing, and going to get up the chimney again. Of course she was very much frightened, and no wonder. But that was all. The boy had taken nothing in the room. By the mark of his little sooty feet they could see that he had never been off the hearth-rug till the nurse caught hold of him. It was all a mistake. So Sir John told Grimes to go home, and promised him five shillings if he would bring the boy quietly up to him, without beating him, that he might be sure of the truth. For he took for granted, and Grimes too, that Tom had made his way home but no Tom came back to Mr. Grimes that evening, and he went to the police office to tell them to look out for the boy, but no Tom was heard of. As for his having gone over those great fells to Vendale, they no more dreamed of that than of his having gone to the moon. So Mr. Grimes came up to Harthover next day with a very sour face, but when he got there Sir John was over the hills and far away and Mr. Grimes had to sit in the outer servants' hall all day, and drink strong ale to wash away his sorrows, and they were washed away long before Sir John came back. For good Sir John had slept very badly that night, and he said to his lady, "'My dear, the boy must have got over into the grouse moors and lost himself, and he lies very heavily on my conscience, poor little lad, but I know what I will do.' So, at five the next morning, up he got and into his bath, and into his shooting-jacket and gaiters, and into the stable-yard, like a fine old English gentleman, with a face as red as a rose, and a hand as hard as a table, and a back as broad as a bullock's, and bade them bring his shooting-pony, and the keeper to come on his pony, and the huntsman, and the first whip, and the second whip, and the under-keeper with the bloodhound in a leash, a great dog, as tall as a calf, of the colour of a gravel-walk, with mahogany ears and nose, and a throat like a church bell. They took him up to the place where Tom had gone into the wood, and there the hound lifted up his mighty voice, and told them all he knew. Then he took them to the place where Tom had climbed the wall, and they shoved it down and all got through. And then the wise dog took them over the moor, and over the fells, step by step, very slowly, for the scent was a day old, you know and very light from the heat and drought. But that was why cunning old Sir John started at five in the morning. And at last he came to the top of Luthwaite Crag, and there he bayed, and looked up in their faces, as much as to say, I tell you, he has gone down here. They could hardly believe that Tom would have gone so far, and when they looked to that awful cliff, they could never believe that he would have dared to face it. But if the dog said so, it must be true. "'Heaven forgive us,' said Sir John. "'If we find him at all we shall find him lying at the bottom.' 
and he slapped his great hand upon his great thigh, and said, "'Who will go down over Luthwaite Crag, and see if that boy is alive? Oh, that I were twenty years younger, and I would go down myself!' And so he would have done, as well as any sweep in the county. Then he said, Twenty pounds to the man who brings me that boy alive. And, as was his way, what he said, he meant. Now, among the lot was a little groom boy, a very little groom indeed, and he was the same who had ridden up the court and told Tom to come to the hall. And he said, Twenty pounds or none, I will go down Luthway Crag, if it's only for the poor boy's sake for he was a civil and spoken little chap as ever climbed a flue. So down over Luthwaite Crag he went. A very smart groom he was at the top, and a very shabby one at the bottom, for he tore his gaiters, and he tore his breeches, and he tore his jacket, and he burst his braces, and he burst his boots, and he lost his hat, and what was worst of all, he lost his shirt-pin, which he prized very much, for it was gold, and he had won it in a raffle at Moulton, and there was a figure at the top of it, of told mare, noble old Beeswing herself, as natural as life. So it was a really severe loss, but he never saw anything of Tom. And all the while Sir John and the rest were riding round, full three miles to the right, and back again, to get into Vendale and to the foot of the crag. When they came to the old dame's school, all the children came out to see. And the old dame came out too, and when she saw Sir John she curtsied very low, for she was a tenant of his. "'Well, dame, and how are you?' said Sir John. "'Blessings on you as broad as your back, Hearthover,' says she. She didn't call him Sir John, but only Hearthover, for that is the fashion in the North Country. "'And welcome into Vendale. But you're no hunting the fox this time of the year.' "'I am hunting.' "'And strange game, too,' said he. "'Blessings on your heart, and what makes you look so sad the morn?' "'I'm looking for a lost child, a chimney-sweep, that is run away.' "'Oh, Hearthover, Hearthover,' says she, "'ye were always a just man, and a merciful, "'and ye'll no harm the poor little lad if I give you tidings of him.' "'Not I, not I, dame. "'I'm afraid we hunted him out of the house all on a miserable mistake.' and the hound has brought him to the top of Luthwaite Crag, and—' Whereat the old dame broke out crying, without letting him finish his story. "'So he told me the truth after all, poor little dear. Ah, first thoughts are best, and a body's heart'll guide them right if they will but hearken to it.' And then she told Sir John all. "'Bring the dog here and lay him on,' said Sir John, without another word and he set his teeth very hard. And the dog opened at once, and went away at the back of the cottage, over the road and over the meadow, and through a bit of alder copse, and there, upon an alder stump, they saw Tom's clothes lying. And then they knew as much about it all as there was any need to know. And Tom? Ah! Now comes the most wonderful part of this wonderful story. Tom, when he woke, for of course he woke, children always wake after they have slept exactly as long as is good for them, found himself swimming about in the stream, being about four inches, or, that I may be accurate, 3.87902 inches long, and having round the parotid region of his fauces a set of external gills, I hope you understand all the big words, just like those of a sucking eft, which he mistook for a lace frill, till he pulled at them, found he hurt himself, and made up his mind that they were part of himself, and best left alone. In fact, the fairies had turned him into a water-baby. A water-baby? You never heard of a water-baby? Perhaps not. That is the very reason why this story was written. There are a great many things in the world which you never heard of, and a great many more which nobody ever heard of, and a great many things, too, which nobody will ever hear of, at least until the coming of the Coxigrues, when man shall be the measure of all things. 
"'But there are no things as water babies.' "'How do you know that? Have you been there to see? And if you had been there to see, and had seen none, that would not prove that there were none. If Mr. Garth does not find a fox in Eversley Wood, as folks sometimes fear he never will, that does not prove that there are no such things as foxes. And, as is Eversley Wood to all the woods in England, so are the waters we know to all the waters in the world. And no one has a right to say that no water babies exist, till they have seen no water babies existing, which is quite a different thing, mind, from not seeing water babies, and a thing which nobody ever did, or perhaps ever will do. But surely if there were water babies, somebody would have caught one at least. Well, how do you know that somebody has not? But they would have put it into spirits, or into the illustrated news, or perhaps cut it into two halves, poor dear little thing, and sent one to Professor Owen and one to Professor Huxley, to see what they would each say about it. Ah, my dear little man, that does not follow at all, as you will see before the end of the story. But a water baby is contrary to nature. Well, but my dear little man, you must learn to talk about such things, when you grow older, in a very different way from that. You must not talk about ain't and can't, when you speak of this great wonderful world round you, of which the wisest man knows only the very smallest corner, and is, as the great Sir Isaac Newton said, only a child picking up pebbles on the shore of a boundless ocean. You must not say that this cannot be, or that that is contrary to nature. You do not know what nature is, or what she can do, and nobody knows, not even Sir Roderick Murchison, or Professor Owen, or Professor Sedgwick, or Professor Huxley, or Mr. Darwin, or Professor Faraday, or Mr. Grove, or any other of the great men whom good boys are taught to respect. They are very wise men and you must listen respectfully to all they say. But even if they should say, which I am sure they never would, that cannot exist, that is contrary to nature, you must wait a little, and see, for perhaps even they may be wrong. It is only children who read Aunt Agitate's arguments, or Cousin Cramchild's conversations, or lads who go to popular lectures, and see a man pointing at a few big ugly pictures on the wall, or making nasty smells with bottles and squirts for an hour or two, and calling that anatomy or chemistry, who talk about cannot exist and contrary to nature. Wise men are afraid to say that there is anything contrary to nature, except what is contrary to mathematical truth, for two and two cannot make five, and two straight lines cannot join twice, and a part cannot be as great as the whole, and so on at least so it seems at present. But the wiser men are, the less they talk about, cannot. That is a very rash, dangerous word, that cannot. And if people use it too often, the queen of all the fairies, who makes the clouds thunder and the fleas bite, and takes just as much trouble about one as about the other, is apt to astonish them suddenly by showing them that although they say she cannot, yet she can, and what is more, will, whether they approve or not. And therefore it is that there are dozens and hundreds of things in the world which we should certainly have said were contrary to nature if we did not see them going on under our eyes all day long. If people had never seen little seeds grow into great plants and trees of quite different shape from themselves, and these trees again produce fresh seeds, to grow into fresh trees, they would have said, The thing cannot be, it is contrary to nature. And they would have been quite as right in saying so, as in saying that most other things cannot be. Or suppose again that you had come, like Monsieur de Chelieu, a traveller from unknown parts, and that no human being had ever seen or heard of an elephant and suppose that you described him to people, and said, This is the shape, and the plan, and anatomy of the beast, and of his feet, 
and of his trunk, and of his grinders, and of his tusks, though they are not tusks at all, but two foreteeth run mad. And this is a section of his skull, more like a mushroom than a reasonable skull of a reasonable or unreasonable beast, and so forth and so forth, and though the beast, which I assure you I have seen and shot, is first cousin to the little hairy coney of Scripture, second cousin to a pig, and, I suspect, thirteenth or fourteenth cousin to a rabbit, yet he is the wisest of all beasts, and can do everything save read, write, and cast accounts. People would surely have said, "'Nonsense! Your elephant is contrary to nature!' and have thought you were telling stories, as the French thought of Levaillant, when he came back to Paris, and said that he had shot a giraffe, and as the king of the cannibal islands thought of the English sailor, when he said that in his country water turned to marble, and rain fell as feathers. They would tell you, the more they knew of science, "'Your elephant is an impossible monster, contrary to the laws of comparative anatomy, as far as is yet known.' To which you would answer the less, the more you thought. Did not learned men, too, hold till within the last twenty-five years, that a flying dragon was an impossible monster? And do we not now know that there are hundreds of them found fossil up and down the world? People call them pterodactyls, but that is only because they are ashamed to call them flying dragons, after denying so long that flying dragons could exist. The truth is that folks fancy that such and such things cannot be, simply because they have not seen them, is worth no more than a savage's fancy that there cannot be such a thing as a locomotive, because he never saw one running wild in the forest. Wise men know that their business is to examine what is and not to settle what is not. They know that there are elephants, they know that there have been flying dragons, and the wiser they are, the less inclined they will be to say positively that there are no water-babies. No water-babies, indeed! Why, wise men of old said everything on earth had its double in the water, and you may see that that is, if not quite true, still quite as true as most other theories, which you are likely to hear for many a day. There are land babies, then why not water babies? Are there not water rats, water flies, water crickets, water crabs, water tortoises, water scorpions, water tigers, and water hogs, water cats and water dogs, sea lions and sea bears, sea horses and sea elephants, sea mice and sea urchins, sea razors and sea pens, sea combs and sea fans, and of plants, are there not water-grass, and water-crowfoot, water-millfoil, and so on, without end? But all these things are only nicknames. The water-things are not really akin to the land-things. That's not always true. They are, in millions of cases, not only of the same family, but actually the same individual creatures. Do not even you know that a green drake, and an alder fly, and a dragon fly, live under water till they change their skins, just as Tom changed his. And if a water animal can continually change into a land animal, why should not a land animal sometimes change into a water animal? Don't be put down by any of Cousin Cramchild's arguments, but stand up to him like a man, and answer him, quite respectfully, of course, thus. If Cousin Cramchild says, that if there are water-babies, they must grow into water-men, ask him how he knows that they do not, and then, how he knows that they must, any more than the Proteus, of the Adelsberg caverns, grows into a perfect newt. If he says that it is too strange a transformation, for a land-baby to turn into a water-baby, ask him if he ever heard of the transformation of Silis, or the Distomas, or the common jellyfish of which M. Cotrefage says excellently well. Who would not exclaim that a miracle had come to pass, if he saw a reptile come out of the egg dropped by the hen in his poultry-yard, and the reptile give birth at once to an indefinite number of fishes and birds? Yet the history of the jellyfish is quite as wonderful as that would be. Ask him if he knows about all this, and if he does not, tell him to go and look for himself, and advise him, 
very respectfully, of course, to settle no more what strange things cannot happen, till he has seen what strange things do happen every day. If he says that things cannot degrade, that is, change downwards into lower forms, ask him, who told him that water babies were lower than land babies? But even if they were, does he know about the strange degradation of the common goose barnacles, which one finds sticking on ships' bottoms, or the still stranger degradation of some cousins of theirs, of which one hardly likes to talk, so shocking and ugly it is? And lastly, if he says, as he most certainly will, that these transformations only take place in the lower animals, and not in the higher, say that that seems to little boys, and to some grown people, a very strange fancy. For if the changes of the lower animals are so wonderful, and so difficult to discover, why should there not be changes in the higher animals far more wonderful, and far more difficult to discover? And may not man, the crown and flower of all things, undergo some change, as much more wonderful than all the rest, as the great exhibition is more wonderful than a rabbit burrow. Let him answer that. And if he says, as he will, that not having seen such a change in his experience, he is not bound to believe it, ask him, respectfully, where his microscope has been. Does not each of us, in coming into this world, go through a transformation just as wonderful as that of a sea-egg, or a butterfly, and does not reason and analogy, as well as scripture, tell us that that transformation is not the last, and that, though what we shall be we know not, yet we are here but as the crawling caterpillar, and shall be hereafter as the perfect fly? The old Greeks, heathens as they were, saw as much as that two thousand years ago, and I care very little for Cousin Cramchild, if he sees even less than they and so forth, and so forth, till he is quite cross. And then tell him that if there are no water babies, at least there ought to be, and that, at least, he cannot answer. And meanwhile, my dear little man, till you know a great deal more about nature than Professor Owen and Professor Huxley put together, don't tell me about what cannot be, or fancy that anything is too wonderful to be true. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, said old David, and so we are, and so is everything around us, down to the very deal table. Yes, much more fearfully and wonderfully made already is the table, as it stands now, nothing but a piece of dead deal wood, than if, as foxes say, and geese believe, spirits could make it dance, or talk to you by rapping on it. Am I in earnest? Oh, dear, no! Don't you know that this is a fairy tale, and all fun and pretense, and that you are not to believe one word of it, even if it is true? But at all events, so it happened to Tom. And therefore the keeper, and the groom, and Sir John made a great mistake, and were very unhappy, Sir John at least, without any reason, when they found a black thing in the water and said it was Tom's body, and that he had been drowned. They were utterly mistaken. Tom was quite alive, and cleaner and merrier than he had ever been. The fairies had washed him, you see, in the swift river, so thoroughly, that not only his dirt, but his whole husk and shell had been washed quite off him, and the pretty little real Tom was washed out of the inside of it, and swam away, as a caddis does, when its case of stones and silk is bored through, and away it goes on its back, paddling to the shore, there to split its skin, and fly away as a caperer, on four fawn-coloured wings, with long legs and horns. They are foolish fellows, the caperers, and fly into the candle at night, if you leave the door open. We will hope Tom will be wiser, now he has got safe out of his sooty old shell. But good Sir John did not understand all this, not being a fellow of the Linnaean society, and he took it into his head that Tom was drowned. When they looked into the empty pockets of his shell, and found no jewels there, nor money, nothing but three marbles and a brass button with a string to it, 
Then Sir John did something as like crying as ever he did in his life, and blamed himself more bitterly than he need have done. So he cried, and the groom-boy cried, and the huntsman cried, and the dame cried, and the little girl cried, and the dairy-maid cried, and the old nurse cried, for it was somewhat her fault, and my lady cried, for though people have wigs, that is no reason why they should not have hearts. But the keeper did not cry, though he had been so good-natured to Tom the morning before, for he was so dried up with running after poachers, that you could no more get tears out of him than milk out of leather. And Grimes did not cry, for Sir John gave him ten pounds, and he drank it all in a week. Sir John sent, far and wide, to find Tom's father and mother, but he might have looked till doomsday for them, for one was dead, and the other was in Botany Bay. And the little girl would not play with her dolls for a whole week, and never forgot poor little Tom. And soon my lady put a pretty little tombstone over Tom's shell in the little churchyard in Vendale, where the old dalesmen all sleep side by side, between the limestone crags. And the dame decked it with garlands every Sunday, till she grew so old that she could not stir abroad, then the little children decked it for her. And always she sang an old, old song, as she sat spinning what she called her wedding dress. The children could not understand it, but they liked it none the less for that, for it was very sweet and very sad, and that was enough for them. And these are the words of it. When all the world is young, lad, and all the trees are green, and every goose a swan lad, and every lass a queen, then hay for boot and horse lad, and round the world away, young blood must have its course lad, and every dog his day. When all the world is old lad, and all the trees are brown, and all the sport is stale lad, and all the wheels run down, creep home and take your place there, the spent and maimed among. God grant you find one face there, you loved when all was young. Those are the words, but they are only the body of it. The soul of the song was the dear old woman's sweet face, and sweet voice, and the sweet old air to which she sang, and that, alas, one cannot put on paper. And at last she grew so stiff and lame, that the angels were forced to carry her, and they helped her on with her wedding dress, and carried her up over half-over fells, and a long way beyond that too. And there was a new schoolmistress in Vendale, and we will hope that she was not certificated. And all the while Tom was swimming about in the river, with a pretty little lace collar of gills about his neck, as lively as a grig, and as clean as a fresh-run salmon. Now, if you don't like my story, then go to the schoolroom and learn your multiplication table, and see if you like that better. Some people, no doubt, would do so. So much the better for us, if not for them. It takes all sorts, they say, to make a world. End of chapter 2, part 2. This recording is in the public domain.